The world has been waiting a long time for the headlines that we're seeing. It's amazing that the Bible has devoted a big chunk of space, two entire chapters, to describe in detail an upcoming war in the Middle East that will involve a massive invasion of Israel from the north. And yet few in the churches, except for a handful of eschatologists, talk about it, despite the fact that conditions are now almost certainly in place for the prophetic war of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. It's all gearing up to a time when God will move in a miraculous way to defend the state of Israel. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. When the Middle Eastern War described in the Bible in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 happens, the world really shouldn't be caught by surprise because a battle of biblical proportions is described in astounding detail in this book. And if people weren't so biblically illiterate, they'd know that the war is imminent because alignments of nations described by the prophet Ezekiel are virtually in place. When will this war happen? Well, the Bible tells us it will happen in the latter days sometime after the nation of Israel has been regathered back in her own land. It's important to recognize that these two chapters, Ezekiel 38 and 39, describe this future war to follow immediately after the events of chapters 36 and 37. And those two chapters give us detailed preparatory steps that had to happen first concerning the return of the Jewish and Israelite exiles. Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37 describe the resurrection of the dry bones of Israel's Holocaust and then the regathering of Israel to her land in the last days. The new nation of Israel has been an established fact now for 70 years, an entire generation. And so then the next chapters, Ezekiel 38 and 39, foretell that at this time Persia, which is, of course, modern-day Iran, will go to war upon the mountains of Israel. Persia, Iran, will be aligned militarily with a region called Magog, as well as with a coalition of other allies, including modern-day Turkey. Eschatologists have determined that Magog is the land of Russia. And have you noticed how Russian aggression has increased? We believe it's no coincidence that Russia, Turkey, and Iran are all involved in the deteriorating situation in Syria. And the prophecy of Isaiah 17 that Damascus will become a heap of ruins is coming to pass. And don't forget that Damascus is only about 40 miles from Israel's mountainous northern border on the Golan Heights. The prophetic war described in the book of Ezekiel has never happened because the world has never reached the latter days until now. The sign of the reemergence of Israel is the key to understanding the times. So please take time to study these chapters for yourself but we're going to give you a preview. So let's dip into Ezekiel 38 for a few minutes. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Now Gog is a title for a powerful leader. The Bible commentaries explain that Gog was probably a common title like Pharaoh was in Egypt. Verse 2 says, Son of man, turn your attention toward Gog and denounce Gog from the land of Magog. At verse 3, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshef, and Tubal. Early Jewish tradition, adopted by Josephus and St. Jerome, identified Magog were the Scythians who lived around the north of the Black Sea. 
the Prince of Roche refers to the Russians, and that's according to the consensus of the rabbinic sages. In Ezekiel 38, the Almighty says he's the one who will actually bait Gog and all the hordes into this battle. The chapter says, prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you. And like ancient captives were treated figuratively, God says, I'm going to put hooks into your jaws and bring you down with your armies against the mountains of Israel. Well, now, what will these hordes be coming after? Israel's new gas fields with the cover excuse of needing to force a false UN peace deal? Well, it's interesting that in verse 5, Persia, Iran, is listed as Russia's number one ally along with many other nations. And it's going to be an unholy alliance. Think for a moment of the continual threats that Iran has been making against Israel. Iran continually boasts that it's going to destroy Israel. It's going to wipe Israel off the map. The mullahs controlling Iran unashamedly issue threats of genocide all the time. And the Israelis know that these dangerous threats are not idle. I'm old enough to remember when Iran was pro-West and pro-Israel. But all that changed after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. When, think about this, 2,500 years of continuous Persian monarchy were discarded, making way for a radical new change in the Middle Eastern neighborhood. Now Russia is backing Iran, while Turkey is turning against Israel and becoming more aggressive. Well, continuing in verse 6, it says that Gomar and all of its bands, the house of Togamath, of the north quarters and all of his bands, and many people will invade the mountains of Israel. This is an antique map with biblical place names showing these names, and modern-day Turkey is in the mix. Verse 8, in future years, in other words, this war wasn't going to happen in Ezekiel's day, in future years, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, and a confederation of nations will invade a land, the Bible says, that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations onto the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. The Israelis had been brought out, it says, from the nations and reunited, and now they're living in safety. So this chapter describes Israelis who've been brought back from the sword and gathered from all over the globe. And indeed, we are eyewitnesses of these things in our generation. And so the Almighty says to Gog, you will come unto the mountains of Israel, which had been desolate. And we know that the Holy Land was utterly desolate before the Jews returned and before they revived the Holy Land. Because in his book, Innocence Abroad, Mark Twain described the Holy Land as a desolate place when he visited in 1867. He described it as a country devoid of vegetation and of human population. Well, Ezekiel 38 and verse 9 continues, You shall ascend, you shall come like a storm. You shall cover the land like a cloud, you and your many hordes and all the peoples with you. I find this a small point, but still fascinating to me that even though the invasion comes down from the north, God says in this verse that the invaders will ascend to the Holy Land. I checked the Hebrew and from the Hebrew verb, we get the word aliyah, which is defined as the act of going up, going up towards Jerusalem. By the way, the opposite action, immigration from the land of Israel, is referred to in Hebrew as a descent. And so whenever I'm going up to Jerusalem, I'm always aware of ascending. And whenever I have to leave, I'm always aware, sadly, of descending to the nations. So God says to the invaders, you and all your troops will go up advancing like a storm. You'll be like a cloud covering the land. But God said he's going to destroy these hordes 
on the mountains of Israel. As I've often said, it's going to be a confrontation between God and the nations like Elijah the prophet had with the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. When the fire of God fell, and then the people of Israel acknowledge that their God is indeed God. Well, after all, Israel's been through these past 70 years to survive. It's hard to imagine that Russia could fall prey to such chutzpah to lead such a bold invasion. But verse 10 explains the reason. It says, on that day, thoughts will enter your mind and you will devise an evil plan. Verse 11 says, you will say, I will go up against an open country. I will come against those who are living in peace and who are resting securely to take a spoil and to seize plunder. The willful way in which this is expressed, I will go up, God says, I will come against those who are living securely, reminds me of the prideful spirit exhibited by the adversary Satan over in Isaiah chapter 14. I'm going to look at that for a minute because it's so fascinating. Starting with verse 12, it says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet God says that Satan will be brought down to the depths of Sheol, to the lowest pit. Hallelujah. And that's what Ezekiel 38 and 39 says, predicts, is going to happen to this leader Gog and all of his allies. Terrible destruction. And what about the fact that Ezekiel 38, this chapter describes the regathered Israelis living in unwalled villages. Although there is a security barrier in Israel, a wall and a high fence constructed against terrorism, and it's more than 400 miles long, nevertheless, the individual towns and cities in Israel are no longer walled up with high stone walls as in Bible days. Also at this point, we have to ask the question, if there is an invasion uh, of the mountains of Israel, where are Israel's allies and where is the United States in all of this? Some eschatologists say the answer is found in verse 13 of Ezekiel 38, which speaks of the Tarshish group of nations, as well as the lands of Sheba and Dedan. So let's look at verse 13. It says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all of its young lions shall say to Gog, have you come to take great spoil? Have you come to seize much plunder? Scholars say Sheba and Dedan are Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, which have been drawing closer behind the scenes in recent times with Israel because of their fear of the mullahs who have arisen in Iran. Tarshish, on the other hand, is associated with Great Britain. And so the young lions of Tarshish would be Britain's offspring, so to speak, Britain's former colonies, such as the United States and Commonwealth countries, such as Canada. So in verse 13, Sheba, Dedan, and the Tarshish group of nations all seem to distance themselves and engage only in diplomatic rhetoric. Sheba, Dedan, and the Tarshish nations apparently don't want to get involved in this regional conflict. And that's because God himself is going to take all the credit and he's going to receive all the glory for defending Israel. He's setting it all up. Well, verse 15 says, Gog will come from your place out of the outermost parts of the north. 
And if you look at a map, the nation that is above Israel at the uttermost parts of the north is Russia. And Moscow is directly north of Jerusalem. God says, you will come up against my people Israel. And that's a dangerous and presumptuous idea. They're going to come like a cloud covering the land. When? Verse 16 reiterates that this massive invasion will take place in the latter years, in the last days. So far in the future from Ezekiel's time, the last days, which we're in now, God says, I'm going to bring you against my land. So notice that God calls Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, his land. It's his real estate, and he gave it to the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Verse 18 prophesies that when Gog dares to invade the land of Israel, the Lord will burn with anger. The prophet Ezekiel says there's going to be a massive earthquake. Both the land and the sea are going to shake. Then in verse 22 of Ezekiel 38, God says he will rain down fire and brimstone, burning sulfur on the invaders. That sounds to me like a judgment of biblical proportions, as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And why? Because God says in verse 23, he's going to demonstrate my greatness, my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of all of the nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes in prayer meetings, we hear somebody quoting Isaiah 64. Oh, God, that you might rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains should tremble before you. But I wonder if they have any idea what they're actually praying. Because Ezekiel says the Almighty is going to rend the heavens and is not going to be very pretty because the invading armies will be destroyed. This divine intervention will shake the world. And from that day forward, the nation of Israel and the world will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the God of Israel is the only true God. All others claiming to be God have been imposters and pretenders. Now the term, the latter years, is a Hebrew expression in the Bible that's synonymous with the end times. We need to understand this. Just prior to the second coming of the Messiah. This means the church age and the times of the Gentiles are almost finished. So when I hear preachers talking about the church continuing 500 years from now, as if the second coming is vaguely far away in the future, well, I think they're just out of touch with the reality of Bible prophecy. They simply don't understand the times that we're privileged to be living in. Bible scholars are also divided as to whether this Ezekiel war is part of the prophetic battle of Armageddon or if it's a separate war that will trigger the final seven-year period prophesied not only by the prophet Daniel, but also in the book of Revelation. But whether the Ezekiel War is part of Armageddon or an earlier separate war, this we do know. Alignments of nations are in place now to fit the prophecy. The involvement in Syria of Russia, Iran, and Turkey surely signals that the Ezekiel War is getting very close. Recently, I'd been meditating on how news events are already foreshadowing this unholy alliance against Israel. And lo and behold, my thoughts were confirmed through the post because I received a gift copy of a book by my friend Pastor Derek Walker of the Oxford Bible Church in England. He kindly sent the revised and expanded edition of his book called The Imminent Invasion of Israel. What timing to receive that book. In the introduction to the revised edition, Pastor Derek wrote that he first authored his book eight years ago under the conviction that Ezekiel's prophecy could be fulfilled at any time. He and other Bible scholars seem certain this war is imminent because of the clarity of details that's revealed in Ezekiel 38 and 39. 
In our lifetime, we've seen much Bible prophecy fulfilled, especially the rebirth of Israel in 1948 and the recapture of Israel's capital, Jerusalem, in 1967, just as Jesus himself prophesied in Luke 21, 24. But now Pastor Derek revised his book because he wanted to draw more attention to the fact that the invasion will take place upon the mountains of Israel. Indeed, the mountains of Israel are what the world calls the West Bank and the so-called occupied territories. Furthermore, international developments concerning the principal invaders, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, have increased the convictions of eschatologists that the stage has been set as never before for an imminent invasion. All the major players are lining up within the picture that was painted long ago by Ezekiel. In fact, the Syrian war has already opened the door for Russia, Iran, and Turkey to establish military footholds in the region. Pastor Derek's book, The Imminent Invasion of Israel, can be ordered through his website. Meanwhile, the new American administration is taking a confrontational approach to Iran, and so Iran is being pulled increasingly into Russia's orbit of influence, especially as allies in Syria. I've been pondering what sort of moral justification will be claimed by the invading coalition to try to give a veneer of respectability to their invasion. Pastor Derek observed that the anti-Israel UN Resolution 2334, which Barack Obama failed to veto in the last days of his presidency, that resolution may be used as a pretext. Russia may also try to impose a two-state solution involving the West Bank, even though in God's eyes, the so-called West Bank is in fact biblical Judea and Samaria. By seizing the initiative, as Russia has done already in Syria, Russia would claim to be helping the Palestinians, but Russia's real ulterior motive might be to gain a strategic victory and economic advantage in the region. However, for whatever reason, the invasion of God's land will simply backfire because God says his fury will come up in his face when that happens and he himself will enter the fray and retaliate. Ezekiel 39 describes the gruesome aftermath of this war. And because a seven-year cleanup period is specified, I don't believe the Ezekiel War is Armageddon itself. The verses seem to indicate that the Israelis will use special cleanup procedures, such as are described in military warfare manuals concerning nuclear, biological, or chemical warfare. We simply can't ignore these Bible prophecies because disaster will befall the invaders. At this time, Turkey is still a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization called NATO. NATO is an alliance between 29 North American and European countries for mutual defense against attacks. Collective security or collective defense is enshrined in Article 5 of NATO's founding treaty. And it means that an attack against one ally is considered an attack against all allies. The treaty was first invoked after the 9-11 terrorism attacks, and it's also been implemented after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and for the civil war in Syria. For years, Bible prophecy teachers and scholars speculated that the one piece of the puzzle from the Ezekiel 38 and 39 scenario that didn't fit was NATO member Turkey. But have you noticed how Turkey is increasingly aligning itself with Russia and Iran and turning against Israel? Just as this prophecy predicts. It seems like there's not a day that the headlines foreshadowing the Ezekiel War aren't popping up. And here's something extremely important to contemplate. In order to maintain the imminent aspect of the Lord's sudden appearing, many Bible prophecy watchers believe that the biblical and prophetic event referred to as the rapture 
must take place sometime before God intervenes in the Ezekiel War. So let me ask you this. If the Lord should suddenly return for his bride today or tonight, would you be ready to go with him? Anybody who calls himself or herself a Christian, as a believer in Jesus, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, is instructed in the New Testament to check ourselves out, to be sure that we're truly following the Lord and that we're not just a believer in name only or that we're not an almost believer or somebody who's lukewarm in our faith. Because Jesus warns us in Luke 21, 36 to watch and pray always, not just sometimes, but pray always that we'll be counted worthy not through our worthiness, but through his righteousness and through his worthiness to escape all these awful events that will soon come to pass. For the Bible promises true and faithful believers who happen to be alive at his appearing and who've endured that we will not be appointed to endure God's end time wrath that will be poured out upon the whole world, but that we will be caught up to be with the Lord in the atmosphere. So I want you to know that the doctrine of the sudden removal of true believers before the revelation of the Antichrist is not a doctrine that was concocted in the 19th century or imagined up by some editor of a Bible. But it's a doctrine that's found in many types and shadows in the Hebrew scriptures, as well as many New Testament scriptures, such as Luke 21, 36, 1 Thessalonians 4:17 and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. So, dear friends, we want to invite you to be watchmen on the walls with us and to be ready for the sudden coming of the Lord. If you have any questions, you can contact me on the social media or at our website at exploits.tv, where you can sign up to receive our updates and free color magazine, Exploits based upon Daniel 11.32, which says the people who do know their God will be strong in these days and not weak and will do exploits, will do the works of the Lord. A reminder that our Jerusalem Channel app enables you to watch all of our videos at any time, and you can download our Jerusalem Channel app to your mobile phone or tablet free of charge. And so until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Darg, Maranatha, and Shalom.